Yes, it is. Welcome back. Thursday, June 24th, 2021. I was listening to some old Paul Harvey speeches and realized what a tragedy so few of the things he said back when he was the king of radio. So many of the things he said went unheeded and are now forgotten. But I suppose there is a reason he was the king of radio in his time. His common sense was a great solve for the common man who was watching an elite absorb more and more of the terrain of our culture and politics. People who read the Washington Post think they own the country, Paul Harvey once put it. He would go on to say people who read the New York Times know that they run the country. People who read the Washington Times think the Washington Post runs the country. And people who read the Wall Street Journal think they own the country. While people who read the USA Today couldn't care less who runs the country as long as the weather map is in color. Interesting point about Washington Post and New York Times, though an interesting point, too, about conservatives who believe the Washington Post runs the country. But from issues ranging from the law and history to education and safety, Paul Harvey spoke to a common wisdom that was then leaving the mainstream and is now fully unrecognized by it. I love this from a speech he gave about 20 years ago. He said, isn't there something absurdly incongruous about a society which regulates so rigidly what we put into our mouths and into our nose and so timidly what goes into our eyes and into our ears? I might add a codicil. Isn't it interesting and incongruous that a society which regulates so rigidly what we put into our lungs and liver seems to care very so little about what goes into our brains. Harvard believed and said if there is one irrefutable lesson to be learned from history, it is that excesses ultimately, inevitably, eventually are their own undoing. He says we will behave or we will be forced to behave. And that is, of course, what we saw in COVID and it is being seen in issues ranging from speech to the environment and certainly one sense of what he meant forced to behave there is a tendency an authoritarian personality that will force us into certain behavior but in another sense we can be forced to behave in the meaning of increasing suffering or punishment or negative public policy outcomes that is to say when you do enough damage you have nothing left but to fix it. But I worry about the old nostalgia pour la buie, the desire for the nostalgia for the mud. Some people like living in recreations of Woodstock, autonomous zones where the return to some kind of pre-civilized state of nature is the highest form of advancement in civilization. You've heard me quote Tom Wolfe before on this from his essay on the Great Relearning. As I read this, keep in mind everything he says can certainly still be true culturally, but also politically. Recrudescence can happen here. Liberty is not guaranteed, and neither is civilization. Tom Wolf put it this way. In 1968 in San Francisco, I came across a curious footnote to the psychedelic movement. At the Haight-Ashbury Free Clinic, there were doctors who were treating diseases no living doctor had ever encountered before. Diseases that had disappeared so long ago they never even picked up Latin names. Diseases such as the mange, the grunge, the itch, the twitch, the thrush, the scroff, the rot. And how was it that they had now returned? It had to do with the fact that thousands of young men and women had migrated to San Francisco to live communally in what I think history will record as one of the most extraordinary religious experiments of all time. The hippies, as they had become known, sought nothing less than to sweep aside all codes and restraints of the past and start out from zero. At one point, Ken Kesey organized a pil pilgrimage to Stonehenge with the idea of returning to Anglo-Saxon civilization point zero, which he thought was Stonehenge and heading out all over again to do it yet better. Among the codes and restraints that people in the communes swept aside quite purposely were those that said you shouldn't use other people's toothbrushes or sleep on other people's mattresses without changing the sheets or as was more likely without using any sheets at all, 
or that you and five other people shouldn't drink from the same bottle of Shasta or take tokes from the same cigarette. And now in 1968, they were relearning the laws of hygiene by getting the mange and the grunge and the itch and the twitch and the thrush and the scroff and the rot. In a sense, there's Paul Harvey's meaning of we will behave or we will be forced to be hot behave, but still with my caveat, for those that want civilization, it's true and not mud. But discount the latter group as insignificant at your peril. To wit, you have an awful lot of lawmakers and would-be political leaders and activists who have been taken in by this country, having come from God-forsaken laboratories of misery. Think of a certain congresswoman from Minnesota as one example, and they have witnessed in this country a wonder like no other, a life people sacrifice their own for to try and achieve and gain. You have an awful lot of people who can see the wonders where a nobody in living conditions from the poorest of the poor can grow up here to be a billionaire or president, regardless of the country of origin or race. They can see this and then want to do what? ape, mimic, and absorb the political practices and philosophy of places like China or the USSR of yore. They can look at the marvel and engine of New York City, built by ingenuity, hard work, and certain ethnic and religious values, and trash it all in an effort in the mayor mayoral office and congressional delegation to turn it into a laboratory of another kind, one of high crime, wedded to socialist economics. Back to Tom Wolfe, quote, in politics, the 20th century's great start from zero was one party, socialism, also known as communism or Marxism, Leninism. Given that system's bad reputation in the West t today, it is instructive to read John Reed's 10 Days That Shook the World before turning to Solzhenitsyn's Gulag Archipelago. The old strike hall poster of a Promethean worker in a blue shirt breaking his chains across his mighty chest was, in truth, the vision of ultimate human freedom, free, freedom the movement believed in at the outset. For intellectuals in the West, the painful dawn began with the publication of the Gulag Archipelago in 1973. And for those who don't remember John Reed or his book, it was the pro-Lenin book covering the October Revolution in 1919. Solzhenitsyn insisted that the villain behind the Soviet concentration camp network was not really Stalin or Lenin, who invented the term concentration camp, or even Marxism. It was instead the Soviets' particularly 20th century notion that they could sweep aside not only the old social order, but also its religious ethic, which had been millennia in the making, common decency as Orwell called it, and they, they could reinvent morality here, now, at the point of a gun, in the famous words of Mao Zedong. Even get the, ever, ever get the sense free market capitalism and religious ethics are right now at their greatest discount or nadir, never mind common decency? I wonder if modern philosophers think economics and religion are societal extras, lan yap, if you will, not necessary rather than something required of a society as much as man that if disrupted or destroyed will be filled by its opposite, in which case we would be looking at Marxism and socialism and moral apathy and acedia. My point is, do economics and religious values matter? If they don't, do away with them. If they do, be careful of what you replace one with the other for. It dawns on me. This return to zero does, as I say, pertain to politics too, not just health. How long did it take to learn what freedom could produce as opposed to what the USSR could produce? And why has China been able to continue to produce in a way that, though through theft, though through bribery, though through forced labor, labor and slavery, how has it been able to continue in a way that a great many Americans admire? Is it that it's better? Or is it that it just isn't America? Or is it that it's poised against America? 
Think on that latter point for a moment, because those who want us to talk the most about the legacy of slavery here seem to have no problem covering up actual, kinetic, real-time, modern-day, current slavery there. They're happy to profit off that. How does that happen? How can that happen? Ibram Kendi says one cannot be a capitalist and an anti-racist at the same time. Thus, capitalists like Jack Dorsey give him tens of millions of dollars. You see, there's a subtle message here. Capitalism equals America and anti-racism, anti-racism does not equal America. And therein is the lie. Capitalism is not uniquely American. Heck, one can find medieval Islamic scholars talking and writing of capitalism's benefits. But anti-racism surely is uniquely American. Find me the country that fought a civil war ending the lives of three quarters of a million people, countrymen. A civil war exclusively over the issue of whether a human being was a human being, irrespective of his, way, of his race. And this is the secret the left cannot stand. Thus they reinvent and reinstantiate it by calling us systematically racist. And sometimes they even invent hoaxes of it. And making it so evident of a conspiracy that it isn't even seeable or evident, don't you know? It's implicit. Systemic and implicit. I sometimes wonder if Someone went to Martin Luther King in 1963 and said, oh, you're going to march because of the systemic and implicit problems that black men face in too much of America? King would, I'm sure, look confused. There was nothing implicit about what he was fighting, and there was nothing he thought the system could not be appealed to in order to redress it, which is why he kept preaching about the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution and kept using America's legislative and legal processes but there is a desire, Dennis Prager spoke of it this morning, among too many to take the good and trash it, to take the beautiful and vulgarize it. But they are not progressive in thought or advanced and enlightened in their thinking, not really, not in the real meaning of those terms. They are rather taking us back to zero as if we've learned nothing, when we indeed have learned a lot. Beware those who are trying to make us dumb again. I am Seth Leibson. We will be right back.